the substitution rule. Let's consider the following integral. We have the integral of 2x times the square root of 1 plus x squared. This is a function that we do not know how to take the integral of. Now, we know how to take the integral of a square root function, right? Because we can rewrite this as x to the 1 half, and then we can use the power rule to get the antiderivative. But we don't have the square root of x. We have the square root of 1 plus x squared. Plus, we have an additional function 2x multiplied to that. This type of integral requires the substitution rule. And I'm going to show you the rule from a very intuitive standpoint prior to actually giving you the formal rule. Let's suppose we chose to make a substitution. I'm going to let the variable u temporarily represent the expression 1 plus x squared. Now, why I would do this is because that would change the square root of 1 plus x squared into the square root of u. But we still have 2x dx left over here. So we need to remember that when we're making a substitution, such as u equals 1 plus x squared, we can find the differential du by taking the derivative of this function, which is 2x, and then multiplying that by the differential dx. We talked about this in an earlier lesson. Now, I want you to notice that du is exactly 2x times dx. And that is exactly what we have left here. So we already replaced 1 plus x squared with the u. And now 2x times dx can be replaced with du. And so when we do that, we end up getting the square root of u times du. And this is a function that we know how to take the antiderivative of. As we mentioned just a moment ago, we can rewrite this as u to the 1 half du using the power rule for antiderivatives. We get this. And then simplifying, we end up with 2 thirds u to the 3 halves plus c. But this isn't the antiderivative of this function. This is the antiderivative of the square root of u. So in the end of the problem now, we have to go back to our substitution, u equals 1 plus x squared, and we need to put this back in for u. So if I put the 1 plus x squared in there, we get 2 thirds times 1 plus x squared quantity to the 3 halves plus c. This process is essentially called the substitution rule. Now, why are we doing this? Well, again, it's because we start out with a function that is rather complicated. But by making a simple substitution and then computing the differential for that substitution, we took this more complicated integral and turned it into a very simple one. So let's go over the substitution rule and then we'll do some examples. The substitution rule states that if u equals g of x is a differentiable function whose range is an interval i and f is continuous on i, then the integral of f of g of x times g prime of x dx is equal to f of u du. Now, before we do our first example here, let's understand what's happening here in this process. So if I'm trying to figure out the integral of f of g of x times 
g prime of x dx, this is a rather complicated function. But I want you to notice that what we have here is a composition of two functions. g of x is the inside function, and f of x is the outside function. Typically what you want to do in the substitution process is let u be equal to the inside of the composition function, which is g of x. In doing this, du will be g prime of x times dx, according to our formula for differentials. And now just notice that the g of x here gets replaced with u, and this whole thing, g prime of x times dx, gets replaced with du. And in making those replacements, this integral becomes the integral of f of u times du, which is what you see here. So by letting u be equal to the inside function, you can sometimes take a more complicated integral and turn it into a much simpler one. Now, I must tell you, this doesn't always work. And what's most important in this process is the du portion. You must have the du portion in order to be able to complete this process. And we'll talk more about that as we go through some examples. Let's go ahead and take a look at this one. So I have the integral of x cubed times cosine of the quantity x to the fourth plus 2. This is a rather complicated function. Now, what we do know is how to integrate cosine when it's all by itself. So let's try to simplify this integral by letting u be equal to x to the fourth power plus 2. If I do that, du will be 4x cubed times dx. Now, what's very important is for this to work, I must have the du, as I was mentioning a minute ago. This part is easy. We know that u is x to the fourth plus 2, so we'll just simply replace this with u. But the question is, what happens to x cubed times dx? Well, we want to say that it's du, but du is 4 times x cubed times dx. So what I'm going to do here is take this integral of x cubed cosine of x to the fourth plus 2 dx, and I'm going to multiply by 4 here, and I'm going to multiply by 1 fourth on the outside. Now, why I'm doing that is because 1 fourth times 4 cancels out, and it gives us the integral that we started with. But here's the magic. 4x cubed times dx is precisely what du is equal to, and du can now replace both of these. So when I put in the substitution, I'm going to get 1 fourth on the outside of our integral, times the integral of the cosine of u, that is this part, making the substitution u equals x to the fourth plus 2. And then 4x cubed times dx is precisely du. And now we have a simple integral that we know how to do. The antiderivative of cosine of u is sine of u. And then the last step is take your x to the fourth plus 2 and plug it back in for u. So this becomes 1 fourth sine of x to the fourth plus 2. And then don't forget to put your arbitrary constant plus c. Another example. Integral of the square root of 2x plus 1. Now, when you first look at this, you might think, well, why do we need substitution for this? This integral is not that bad. But remember, the only kind of square root that we know how to integrate is the square root of just a variable, let's say u. Right? This we know how to do because we can use the power rule. 
But we don't have the square root of u or the square root of x. We have the square root of 2x plus 1. So I'm going to simply make the substitution let u equal 2x plus 1. du will be the derivative of 2x plus 1, which is 2, multiplied by dx. Now, again, for this to work, you have to have your du in the integral. du is 2 times dx. I do not have the 2 multiplied to the dx. So what I'm going to do is simply put it in there. So I will multiply by 2 here, and then to compensate for that, I will put the reciprocal of that number on the outside. Again, because 1 half times 2 would cancel out. So this becomes 1 half integral square root of 2x plus 1 is the square root of u, because u equals that. And then 2 times dx is just du. And so what we have now is 1 half integral of u to the 1 half du. That's 1 half times, power rule says, u to the 1 half plus 1, which is 3 halves, divided by 3 halves. This is 1 half multiplied by the reciprocal of 3 halves, which is 2 thirds, times u to the 3 halves. Here the 2's cancel out, and we get 1 third u to the 3 halves. And then don't forget our last but very important step is you need to substitute your original variable expression back in for u. And so this becomes 1 third times 2x plus 1 quantity to the 3 halves plus c. For our next example, we have the integral of x over the square root of 1 minus 4x squared dx. Once again, we have a square root involved. And one of the most common substitutions that you will make is letting u be equal to the inside of the radical. So if I do that, du here is going to be negative 8x dx. Now we get a little bit of good news here. We have x times dx in this integral, which is this part, but we do not have the negative 8. So again, I'm going to multiply here by negative 8. And to compensate for that, on the outside, I will put the reciprocal of negative 8, which is negative 1 eighth. And now we have negative 8 times x times dx, and all of that is equal to du. So du will replace all three of these factors. And so this integral becomes negative 1 eighth integral of du divided by, and now in the denominator we have the square root of u. Now we're going to rewrite this as negative 1 eighth times u to the negative 1 half du. So remember, if you have 1 over radical u, you can write that as 1 over u to the 1 half, and you can change that to a negative exponent. This is now equal to negative 1 eighth and the antiderivative of u to the negative 1 half. Be careful here when you have fractions, especially if they are negative power rule says you need to add 1 to the exponent and then divide by that same number. And so this is negative 1 eighth times u to the 1 half divided by 1 half. This is negative 1 eighth. When you divide by 1 half, that's the same as multiplying by 2 over 1 and then u to the 1 half. This simplifies to be negative 1 fourth u to the 1 half. And last but not least, resubstitute 1 minus x squared back in replacing the u. And that will give us negative 1 fourth 
times 1 minus 4x squared to the 1 half plus c. And this is our answer. Now, of course, you can rewrite this as a radical. You could say it's negative 1 fourth times the square root of 1 minus 4x squared plus c. Both of these answers are acceptable. Next, we have the integral of e to the 5x. So let's keep in mind that we know the integral of e to the x dx is e to the x. So what about e to the 5x? Well, we have to do a substitution on this. What we're going to do here is let u equal the exponent, 5x. And then du will be 5 times dx. Now again, we don't have the 5 multiplied by the dx, so we will just create it. Let me make a little space here. So we'll put 5 in here. And if I multiply by 5, I'm going to multiply by 1 fifth, the reciprocal, because again, these would cancel out, which would give us our original integral. But now this becomes 1 fifth integral e to the 5x is e to the u, and then 5 times dx is du. Now, what is the integral of e to the u? Well, it is, of course, e to the u. But again, plug 5x back in for u when you're finished. And here is our antiderivative. Okay, this next one is a little bit more work. We have the integral of the square root of 1 plus x squared multiplied by x to the fifth power times dx. Now, as a general rule of thumb, when you have a radical, you will usually want to let u equal the inside of the radical. And that is no different here. So I will let u be equal to 1 plus x squared. We need to compute the differential du, which is the derivative of x squared, or 2x, times dx. Now, do we have 2x dx? Well, I don't see 2x dx, but what about this x to the fifth right here? Let's remember that you can rewrite x to the fifth as x to the fourth times x to the one. So let's go ahead and rewrite this integral in that way. And I'm going to put the x to the fourth in front of the radical. And I'll leave the x after the radical. So I have x to the fourth times x is equal to x to the fifth. And now you can see that we have the x dx that we need here, right here. We just need the 2. So let's go ahead and put the 2 in there. But if I do that on the outside, I need to multiply by 1 half to cancel it. And it would seem that we're well on our way to doing this. We have 1 half. We have the integral. The square root of 1 plus x squared is just the square root of u. 2x dx is du. But then the big question is, what happens to the x to the fourth that was there? you must replace these x's with u's as well. You cannot have mixed variables in your integration problem. So I'm going to go back to the original substitution here. And I'm just going to point out that if you subtract 1 from both sides, you will get u minus 1 is equal to x squared. And then let's remember that x to the fourth is x squared squared. But if x squared is u minus 1, I can put u minus 1 in here, and this becomes u minus 1 squared. So just by manipulating our original substitution, we find out that x to the fourth is the same as u minus 1 squared. And this expression is going to replace this x to the fourth here. And so now if I go ahead and make that replacement, we're going to have 1 half integral 
u minus 1 squared times the square root of u times du. And now it's just a matter of completing this integral. So remember what we did previously? We need to multiply out u minus 1 times u minus 1, which is u squared minus 2u plus 1. And then that is now multiplied by radical u. And the best way to multiply here, when you're doing an integral, it's always best to think of your radical as u to the 1 half. And so when I distribute u to the 1 half to each of these, we'll just be adding exponents. So for example, u squared times u to the 1 half is u to the 2 plus 1 half, which is the same as u to the 5 halves. So we have 1 half integral u to the 5 halves minus 2u times u to the 1 half is u to the 3 halves plus 1 times u to the 1 half. All right, now we have something that we can actually integrate. See, now we have three separate terms, and they're all simple powers of u, which means that we can use the power rule for antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of u to the 5 halves is u to the 5 halves plus 1 divided by 5 halves plus 1, and 5 halves plus 1 is 7 halves. Same thing for this one, 2u to the 3 halves plus 1 is 5 halves, and then divided by 5 halves. And finally, u to the 1 half plus 1, which is u to the 3 halves, and divided by 3 halves. Now we have to take each of these denominators and multiply by the reciprocal. So this will be 2 sevenths u to the 7 halves minus 2 times 2 fifths u to the 5 halves plus 2 thirds u to the 3 halves. And then the last thing I'm going to do is multiply 1 half to all of these. And this is very convenient because this 2 down here is going to cancel out a 2 in each one of these terms. So that's actually really nice. So what we have left is 1 seventh u to the 7 halves minus 2 fifths u to the 5 halves plus 1 third u to the 3 halves plus c. But remember, this is not our final answer because in the beginning, u was equal to 1 plus x squared. So we have to plug 1 plus x squared back in for u here. So this becomes 1 seventh times 1 plus x squared to the 7 halves minus 2 fifths times 1 plus x squared to the 5 halves plus 1 third times 1 plus x squared to the 3 halves plus c. All right, so that one was a little bit more work because when you made your substitution, the very important point to make here is that when you made your substitution, you still had some x terms left over, and you got to get rid of those. So we had to find a new substitution within the original one that we made that will allow us to substitute something in for that x term. All right, so this next one is deceptively not simple. It appears to be simple. How do we integrate tangent of x? So think about this for a minute. We don't know the antiderivative of tangent. What we know is the derivative of tangent is secant squared. But this is not the derivative. This is the antiderivative of tangent. So with trig functions, it is fairly often the case that you will need to bring in some kind of an identity. So let's remember that tangent of x is equal to sine of x over cosine of x. And now I'm going to do a substitution. 
And here's the thing, as a general rule, which means it works very often, but it does not always work. When you have a fraction, u is more than likely going to be something in your denominator. So let me try letting u equal cosine of x. If we do that, du is the derivative of cosine, which is negative sine, times dx. Now, do we have that in our integral? Well, kind of, right? We don't have the negative that we have here. That's not in our integral. But that's easy to add. We'll add a negative here, and then we'll add a negative on the outside to cancel that. And so this integral becomes negative integral. Negative sine of x dx is du. And cosine of x is u. And this is something we know how to integrate. The antiderivative of 1 over u is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of u. And then don't forget your negative in front, plus c. And then one more time, u is cosine. So our final answer here is negative natural log of the absolute value of cosine of x plus c. Now, that is an acceptable answer, but you can actually simplify this answer just a little bit. So let's remember that when you have a number in front of a natural log, so let's say, for example, n times the natural log of x, this number n can be brought up as a power. So you can rewrite this as the natural log of x to the n. So we can do that same thing here. We have negative 1 times the natural log of the absolute value of cosine. What if I took this negative 1 and I brought it up as a power here? This would become the natural log of the absolute value of cosine of x to the negative 1. But that's going to be the natural log of 1 over the absolute value of cosine. Because that's what it means to raise something to the negative 1 power. It just means reciprocal. But then we know that 1 over cosine is secant. And if I do the absolute value of that, that's going to be the absolute value of secant. And so this becomes the natural log of the absolute value of secant of x. And so you, you can rewrite this answer to be the natural log of the absolute value of secant. And just to be clear, both of these are correct. But this one's a little bit nicer because it doesn't have the negative in front of the natural log. So usually this is a formula that you'll have to remember, especially in Calculus 2. And that formula just says the integral of tangent is the natural log of the absolute value of secant plus c. Now let's take a look at some definite integrals. What do you do if you have limits on your integration while using substitution? Well, you pretty much do the same thing. So if I have the integral from 0 to pi over 6, sine of t over cosine squared of t dt, I'm going to start by letting u be equal to something in here. Now let's remember our general rule of thumb, which is normally when you have a fraction, u is going to be either the whole denominator or part of the denominator. Now I just want to show you that if I choose u equals cosine squared, du is going to be 2 cosine of t to the 1 times the derivative of cosine of t times dt. And I want you to notice how complicated that is. And the reason this is complicated is because I chose u to be cosine squared. So this doesn't seem to be a good choice because there's a lot more here than what we have in our integral. So let's modify our choice. Instead of letting u be cosine squared of t, 
How about we just let u be cosine of t? Then du would simply be negative sine of t dt. And then I can rewrite this as the integral from 0 to pi over 6 of negative sine of t dt over cosine squared of t. So all I've done here is put a negative on that. But if I put that negative, I need to make sure that I put a negative on the outside to cancel the negative that I put here. But this is very nice now. We have negative integral. Negative sine of t dt is precisely du. And cosine squared of t is going to be u squared. Now, the big question is, what do you do about the limits? Well, you change them. So let's change the limits. And this is pretty simple to do. So when we have 0 and pi over 6, we're talking about the original variable t. So the lower limit is t equals 0. The upper limit is t equals pi over 6. So what we're going to do is change our limits in the variable t to be limits in the variable u. And to do this, we will use our substitution that we're doing over here. So we know that u is cosine of t. So if t is pi over 6, u is going to be the cosine of pi over 6, which is radical 3 over 2. And if t equals 0, u is going to be the cosine of 0, which is 1. So our new lower limit is 1, and our new upper limit is radical 3 over 2. Now we just have to finish this by integrating. So this is equal to negative integral from 1 to radical 3 over 2, 1 over u squared is u to the negative 2 du. Now we apply the power rule, so we have a negative. We're going to do u to the negative 2 plus 1 divided by negative 2 plus 1. And then we evaluate that from 1 to radical 3 over 2. So I want to point out something very important here. When you change your limits, you do not replace u with your original variable you can skip that step, and that's why this is considered to be a little bit easier. Let's simplify. We have negative u to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. These negatives cancel out, and so we end up with just u to the negative 1, which is 1 over u, and then we're going to evaluate that from 1 to radical 3 over 2. And now this is 1 over radical 3 over 2, minus 1 over 1. And this is 2 over radical 3 minus 1. And you can leave your answer like this. Sometimes you will see that they will rationalize the denominator. So they might multiply by radical 3 over radical 3. And this would become 2 radical 3 over 3 minus 1. And from there, you could also get a common denominator. So 1 is the same as 3 divided by 3. And then you could write this as 2 radical 3 minus 3 over 3. So just understand that these two answers are the same, just two different ways of writing it. Next, we have the integral from 1 to 2 of dx over 3 minus 5x quantity squared. So let's make a substitution here. And first, maybe I should ask, is it obvious that we need to make a substitution? Well, it is, because we have a composition function here. You know, we don't just have x squared in the bottom. So just make a point here. If, if we just had x squared in the bottom, we wouldn't have to do a substitution. We would just use x to the negative 2 and then apply the power rule. But because we have 3 minus 5x squared in the bottom... This requires a substitution. We're going to let u be 3 minus 5x. du will be negative 5 times dx. 
And then what I'm going to do here in this integral is put a negative 5 here and a negative 1 fifth on the outside. This becomes negative 1 fifth integral. What is negative 5 dx? Well, it's du, right? And what is 3 minus 5x? Well, that's u. So we're going to have u squared. And don't forget, we need to change our limits. So if x equals 2, this upper limit here, u is going to be 3 minus 5 times 2, which is negative 7. And if x equals 1, the lower limit here, u will be 3 minus 5 times 1, which is negative 2. And so our integral, we're going to rewrite it as negative 1 fifth integral from negative 2 to negative 7, u to the negative 2. So that is a lot of negatives. But that's okay. Just stick with it. So this is negative 1 fifth. The antiderivative of u to the negative 2 is u to the negative 2 plus 1 divided by negative 2 plus 1. And we evaluate that from negative 2 to negative 7. Let's simplify. We get u to the negative 1 divided by negative 1. Once again, this negative and this negative will cancel out. And this is going to give us 1 fifth times u to the negative 1 is 1 over u. And that is 1 over 5 times u. And then now let's plug in our limits. First, we plug in the top limit, negative 7. This is 1 over 5 times negative 7 minus. And then now plug in the bottom limit, negative 2, which gives us 1 over 5 times negative 2. And this is negative 1 over 35 minus negative 1 over 10. So just to be clear here, I'm taking the negative, putting it on top. Same thing here. And that is negative 1 over 35 plus 1 over 10. And the least common denominator here is 70. So I can multiply by 2 here, multiply by 7 here. And that will give us negative 2 over 70 plus 7 over 70, which is 5 over 70. And that reduces to 1 over 14. In our next problem, we have some natural logs and exponential functions. Integral from 1 to e, natural log of x over x dx. Now, you might remember me saying in previous problems that when you have a fraction, usually you will let u be something in the denominator. This is going to be an exception to that general rule of thumb. Let me rewrite this a different way. I can write this as the natural log of x, and then instead of divided by x, I'll say times 1 over x dx. I think this really helps to see that we want to let u equal the natural log because then the derivative of natural log would be 1 over x. So let's let u be the natural log of x. du will be the derivative of natural log, which is 1 over x, times dx. And so this becomes the integral of u du. Now let's change our limits. If x is equal to e, u is going to be the natural log of e, which is 1. And if x equals 1, u will be the natural log of 1, which is 0. So we just have the integral of u from 0 to 1. Antiderivative of u is u squared over 2. Evaluate it from 0 to 1 using the fundamental theorem of calculus, and we get 1 half. Lastly, let's talk about integrals of symmetric functions. 
If f is an even function, then the integral from negative a to a of f of x dx is 2 times the integral from 0 to a of f of x dx. And if f is an odd function, then the integral from negative a to a of f of x is equal to 0. Let's talk very briefly about why these things are true. So the first one, if you think about an even function, an even function is a function that looks the same on both sides of the y-axis. So if I integrate from negative a to positive a, you're finding the area under the curve, and the area here is the same as the area here. So instead of finding the area from negative a to a, you could just simply find the area from 0 to a and multiply it by 2 because the area over here is the same. So just find the area on the right and double it. That's what this first one says. Now, when can you do that? You can do it when you have an even function. And an even function is a function where f of negative x is equal to f of positive x. And examples of even functions are functions like f of x equals x squared or cosine of x. These are even functions. The second one says that the integral from negative a to a of f of x is 0 if f is an odd function. What's happening here? Well, an odd function is a function that looks something like this. And so if you integrate it from negative a to positive a, what happens is the area here and the area here are the same. But because one area is above the x-axis and the other area is below the x-axis, these areas cancel each other out. And so your, your integral is just 0. Now, what does it mean for a function to be odd? Well, it means you have symmetry through the origin. And examples of odd functions are functions like x cubed or sine of x. Okay, so let's take a look at these two examples. First, we have the integral from negative pi over 3 to positive pi over 3 of x to the fourth times sine of x. So the first thing we need to ask is what kind of function is f of x equals x to the fourth times sine of x. Is it even or is it odd? We have to answer that question. So to answer this question, we will plug negative x into the function. So f of negative x is negative x to the fourth times the sine of negative x. Now, we know that negative x to the fourth is the same as x to the fourth. But sine of negative x is negative sine of x. You learn this in trigonometry. And so this negative here can be factored out to the front, and we can write this as negative x to the fourth times sine of x. And I want you to notice that that is negative f of x, right? Because f of x is this function, and we ended up just getting the opposite of that. So that tells us that this function right here is odd, okay? Because what it means to be odd is f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. Now, since that function is odd, we now immediately know that the integral from negative a to a of that function has to be 0. So the only other thing that has to be true is these numbers have to be opposites of each other, and they are. And so this integral is 0. For the other integral, we have the integral from negative 4 to 4 of x squared. What about x squared? What is it? Well, if I say f of x is equal to x squared, what is f of negative x? Well, it's negative x quantity squared. And we know that that is the same as x squared, which is the original function. So now we have f of negative x is equal to f of x, which means that this function is even. So how do we integrate an even function? Well, what you can do, according to this rule here, 
is you can say that this integral is equivalent to two times the integral from zero to four of x squared dx. And then we just integrate like normal. So this will be two times x cubed over three. And that is two times four to the third over three minus two times zero to the third over three. And this is 128 over three. Now you might think, what is the advantage of doing this? Why do this in the first place when you could have just used the original limits? Well, the reason is very simple. Zero is a nice number, and plugging in zero is often very simple, like it is here. Two times zero cubed is zero. That's much easier than plugging the number negative four into your antiderivative. So that is why this property is sometimes useful. And that concludes this video lesson.